بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Continuing with our journey through this book Zad al-Mustaqna' nah, fi ikhtisar al-Muqna' The author, may Allah have mercy upon him Imam al-Hajjawi today He starts to speak about those things which are makruh in the salah So he says وَيُكْرَهُ فِي الصَّلَاءِ اِتْتِفَاتُهُ and it's disliked, it's makru in the salah, iltifat, to turn left and right with the head. First and foremost, the ruling of makru, what does this mean technically? We know what wajib means, we know what haram means, etc. What is the definition of makru? That's like a linguistic. What is the ruling? What is its thamara? Very good. So, so what was the second part? If you leave it, you get reward. Okay. Okay. Ma yuthabu tarikuhu. Ma yuthabu tarikuhu. The one who leaves it is rewarded. Wala yu'aqib fa'iluhu. And the one who does it is not punished. Very good. Jazakallah khair. Tayyib. So he said, Wa yukrahu fi salah iltifatuhu. Aisha radiyallahu anha, she narrates in Bukhari. She said, سَأَلْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم عن التفات في الصلاة فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم هو اختلاس يختلسه الشيطان من العبد في صلاته That this Aisha رضي الله عنها She asked the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم about التفات in the prayer turning to the left and the right not the body, the head looking around, right? So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said this is اختلاس this is اختلاس that the shaitan does to a person in his prayer. Ikhtilas means that you are tricked into losing something which is valuable, like theft of some sort, right? So it's as though this looking to the left and the right, looking around you, you are losing from your prayer. What are you losing from the prayer? What is being tricked away from you from the prayer? Your khushu, which means, what are you losing? Your focus, your reward, right? Your ajr. So the Prophet ﷺ said in some of the narrations that a person prays but he doesn't get from his prayer except half of it, a quarter of it. And some of them, nothing from their prayer due to the lack of concentration and khushu that they have. So the person in the salah, he tries his best to pray focusing on the words and the meanings and who he's standing in front of. So where does the person put his eyesight when he's praying? Huh? In the position of sujood as we mentioned before, right? If it's done due to a need, like a parent, a mother is praying and her child is in front of her and she's worried that the child may fall into something dangerous, maybe there's a fireplace nearby, then it's allowed in this situation. It's not makru in this situation. Okay? And the greatest of the iltifat, the greatest of this iltifat, this turning away, is the iltifat of the heart, as the ulama mentioned. That you could be praying outwardly properly, but your heart is not concentrating on what you are supposed to be concentrating on. Rather, you are trying to work out all of the problems that you had at work in the salah. This is something that has to be avoided to the best of your ability. The author, he says, And to raise your eyes towards the heaven. As mentioned in Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ said, the Prophet ﷺ said, a people had better stop raising their sights towards the heavens when they pray, or for sure their eyesight will be snatched from them. The Prophet ﷺ gave her a wa'id, a warning. So this, the author, he says, it's makru. An exception to this karaha, an exception to this being makru, is if one is in jama'ah, praying salat al jama'ah, and he wants to burp. So the ulama, they say in this situation, instead of burping, which will harm his... Uh, fellow worshippers, he raises his head and he burps towards the uh, sky and this will help not harming those around him. Shaykh Uthaymin ta'ala from the Hanbali scholars, he said that rather in his opinion, this is not makru, it's haram. How do you think he reached this c conclusion? Our author and those who agree with him, which is the position of the madhab, they say that to do this is to look up to the sky in the salah with your eyes, is Makru. Uthaymin, he said it's haram. What did the hadith say? Who can remember the hadith? 
that the Prophet ﷺ said, for sure a people had better stop raising their sight to the heavens or their eyesight will be snatched away from them. So this hadith is a wa'id, a promise or a threat of punishment. So whenever there is a threat of punishment, then this means that the action that it's talking about is haram. Otherwise, the threat of punishment would not come about. So Uthaymin's opinion from the Hanbali scholars is this. But he said that it doesn't invalidate the salah. If it was done, even though he holds it to be haram, it won't invalidate the salah. Why? Why according to him, who holds it as being haram, if done, it won't invalidate the salah. Hmm? Because the prohibition doesn't return to the prayer itself. It's not connected to the prayer or to one of the shurut of the prayer. Okay? So, therefore, according to this opinion, Uthaymin holds it to be haram, but the official opinion of the madhab that is makruh. Okay? With regards to raising your sight up to the heavens, Shaykh Islam in Taymiyyah, he said that this is permissible in dua. Okay? When you're making du'a in Qunut or whatever, in these kind of situations, it's permissible for you to raise your sight to the heavens. The next thing that the author says is disliked. He says, وَتَغْمِيدْ أَيْنَيْهِ And to close his eyes in the salah. Why do you think to close your eyes in the salah is something which is makruh? Because from other religions, it's known to be the prayer of the Yehud. When the Yehud would pray, they would close their eyes, right? What else? Huh? Possibly. What, what did I ask you just a few moments ago? I said, where do you look in the Salah? So you're losing out on the Sunnah, right? That we were taught to look to our position of sujood in the Salah, right? Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, the humble scholar, he made tafsil. So our author is telling us, makru to close your eyes in the salah. One of the reasons the brother correctly said, because this is the prayer of the Yehud, they close their eyes. Ibn Qayyim, he makes tafsil. Tafsil means, gives extra information. He says, if it's a case that there is nothing in front of you which is distracting you, then it's makru for you to close your eyes. It's disliked. You should pray with your eyes open. However, if there's something in front of you distracting you, you go to some masajid and the carpets, they have these psychedelic patterns on them where you just lose yourself trying to figure out what the pattern is. In this situation, or somebody's running around in front of you, you can close your eyes. Why? Because like they mentioned, the brothers, khashu is so important. Okay? الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صُلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Those who have success are the ones who have khashu, tranquility and concentration in their salah. So if something is taking that away from you, then you can close your eyes according to Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala. The next thing which is makruh that the author mentions, وَإِقْعَاءُهُ The Prophet Sallallahu said, as corrected by Ahmad and others, uh, the hadith of Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu, and the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam naha an iq'a ka iq'a al-kalb that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade the iq'a like the iq'a of the kalb, like the iq'a of the dog. So this is not allowed to be done in the salah. What it means is a sitting position that has to be avoided. So if a person is sitting and he has his legs on either side of his hips and he's sitting on his buttocks, okay? So for in the, uh, between the two sajdas or the tashahud, he has his leg, one, the right leg on the right side and the left leg on the left side and then he's sitting on his bottom. This iq'a is the one which is forbidden and also another way is that somebody has the thighs up towards the chest and the hands behind, okay? Some of the ulama, they say that the iq'a, which is praiseworthy, is between the sajdatain, you sit on your heels. So the person has his feet upright together on the toes and on the heels he places his buttock, okay? This is between the two sajdas. And this is to be done, if you hold this opinion, only sometimes. In any case, what did our author say? He said that the sitting, the iqa, which is, is makru, and we mentioned the two types. The one is when your legs are on either side and you're sitting down. The other is if your thighs are up, close to your chest, and you have your hands behind you. Tayyip, so this type of sitting is something to be avoided. Then he says, وَفْتِرَاشُ ذِرَعَيْهِ سَاجِدًا And to have his arms extended out when he's making sujood. In Bukhari Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, اَتَّدِلُوا فِي السُّجُودِ وَلَا يَبْسُطُوا أَحَدُكُمْ دِرَائِهِ كَإِنْ بِسَاتُ الْكَلْبِ That 
اعتدلوا في السجود Don't go too extreme in the sujood, right? And do not stretch out your arms like the dog stretches out its paws. Okay? So in the sujood, don't be resting on your elbows with your arms stretched out. Rather, as we said, on your hands and your elbows are to be pointing out if you are able to do so. Okay? So the makru is that you rest on your arms. If a person is making a long sujood and he wants to rest, so he knows he's not allowed to put his forearms on the ground. What can he do to help him in that long sujood? Use Cannot use his stomach unless it's huge. Right? <laughs> you're, you're close, you're close, you're close. <laughs> Thighs. Ascent, that's the one. So you put the elbows resting on your knees, okay? That will help you to uh, rest. The next thing that the author mentions, which is makru, wa abathuhu, wa abathuhu. Abath is to do actions in the salah which are not needed and not legislated. Okay, so you start playing with your beard, you start playing with your buttons or whatever it be, your jacket, your clothing, anything of that nature. Any type of playing around in the salah which is not legislated is not allowed because this is a uh, a reflection of somebody having a lack of khushu, a lack of khushu. وَتَخَصُّرُهُ وَتَخَصُّرُهُ also is makru. تَخَصُّر is that a person he gets his hands and he puts them between the hips and the rib cage. Okay, he gets his hands and he puts them between the hips and the rib cage. Okay, and there is ijma' that this applies to both the men and the women, not just the men. Men and the women that this is forbidden for them in the salah. The Prophet Sallallahu said in Bukhari and Muslim, it's narrated, Naha Nabi Sallallahu Sallam, and you salli al rajul mukhtasiran. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade that a man pray mukhtasiran, meaning that his hands are between his hips on his side and his ribcage, okay? That place. What is the illa for this? What is the reasoning for this? Possibly, some of the ulama, they mentioned that this is from the position or the behavior of the mutakabbirin, those who are haughty and arrogant, okay? <clears throat> those who are haughty and arrogant and also as narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha that this is the position where the Yahud would put their hands when praying and others they said as Ibn Abbas that this is tashbih bi shaytan that this is res resembling the shaytan Tayyib. so this takhassur is not permitted it's, it's makru in the salah who would think of doing that anyway very strange but must be there وَتَرَوُّحُهُ وَتَرَوُّحُهُ Okay? Uh, means that a person starts to fan themselves in the salah. This cannot be done, it's not allowed, it's makru, unless there is a need to do so. And also a second meaning of this is mentioned by some of the ulama, but Shaykh Mutlaq Jasr in his explanation, he said that they say that the moving from one leg to the other leg, you move your body weight from one leg to the other leg, this is not what is intended here. So what is intended is fanning yourself unless there is a need to do so. But moving your body weight from one leg to the other leg is something which is permissible if the salah is long. It's something which is permissible. And then he mentions which is makru also is to break your knuckles whereby you make a sound. What's that called? Cracking your knuckles. When you crack your knuckles, okay, this is makru in the salah. Imam Ibn Abi Shayba, he mentions in his Musannaf that Shu'ba, Mawla Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, prayed behind Ibn Abbas and he did this in the Salah. After the Salah, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma reprimanded him. So it's something which is makru in the Salah to do. وَتَشْبِيكُهَا And also in the Salah which is makru is to join your hands together like so. Like so or like so in the salah. Why? Because as collected by Ahmed, Abi Dawood, Afwan, Ahmed ibn Khuzayma and Shaykh al-Albani said that the hadith is authentic. The Prophet sallallahu said, إِذَا تَوَضَّ أَحَدُكُمْ فَأَحْسَنَ وَضُوءَهُ ثُمَّ خَرَجَ عَامِدًا إِلَى الْمَسْجِدِ فَلَا يُشَبِّكَنَّ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ فَإِنَّهُ فِي الصَّلَاةِ That if one of you does wudu and he perfects his wudu, then he goes out intending the masjid, then do not let him make the shabik of his hands because verily he is in the prayer. 
right? So the hadith is saying once he makes wudu and he walks out to the masjid, then don't make tashbik between your hands because he's in prayer. So how is this an evidence from not making tashbik in the salah? What's the wajhud dalala here? Wajhud dalala, what's the point of evidence? Because this is talking about walking to the salah. And I'm saying to you that the author is saying to you when you're in the salah, you cannot make tashbik. How do we take this hadith as an evidence? Because the Prophet Sallallahu said he's in the salah while walking, right? So in Bab al-Awla, then more so when you're in the actual salah, the real salah, then it's more so makruh for you to do. Tayyib, wa an yakunu haqinan. And he says, wa an yakunu haqinan. This word haqin, it comes with two other words, which Ibn Qutayba, he mentioned in Gharib al-Hadith. Ibn Qutayba mentioned in Gharib al-Hadith, you have haqin, you have haqib, and you have haziq. Haqin, which the author mentioned, is that you are desiring to go to the bathroom to urinate, but you are withholding yourself. Okay? So you need, you have the urgency to go to the bathroom, but you say, no, I want to stay in the prayer. Or no, let me start the prayer and get it done first, then I'll go to the bathroom. Or you are haqib, that you go to the bathroom for other than urine. Okay, the other thing. This also is makru. Or you are haziq. Haziq is that you have the desire to pass wind. But you are preventing yourself from doing so. These three things are makru in the salah. Why do you think? Easy one, right? Because it takes away from your khushu. And the Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Muslim, لا صلاة بحضرة الطعام ولا وهو يدافع الأخبثان There is no prayer whilst food is present, nor whilst he is trying to fight off the akhbathan, the needs for going to the bathroom. Okay? So the Prophet ﷺ is saying, do not pray in this situation. And meaning that there is no prayer, means that there is no perfect prayer. Your prayer cannot be perfect in that situation. طيب. What does he say next? أو بحضرة الطعام يشتهيه Or food has been presented to him and he desires it. So this qaid here, this qaid, this qaid that he mentions is very important that he desires it. Not every time food is presented in front of you, you say, Alhamdulillah, I'll eat first, I don't need to go to salah. No. It's if you are desiring it to the extent that you are unable to concentrate in the salah. And it shouldn't be something which is habitual in your life. Because your life's schedule and timetable is planned around the salawat. So everybody knows that salah is going to be soon, so let's not prepare the food for this time. So the Prophet ﷺ in Bukhari and Muslim is mentioned by Anas. He said, إِذَا قُدِمَ الطَّعَامِ إِذَا قُدِمَ الْعَشَاءِ فَابْدَأُوا بِهِ فَابْدَأُوا بِهِ قَبْلَ أَن تُصَلُّوا صَلَاةِ الْمَغْرِبِ وَلَا تَعْجَلُوا عَنْ أَشَائِكُمْ The Prophet ﷺ said that if the food, the supper, the meal around Maghrib time is given to you, then start with that before you go and pray Maghrib. And do not rush your food for the sake of the Salah. So you take your time to fill yourself. You ensure that you are full if you are in that situation of really needing the food so that you go to the Salah and you are able to pray with Khushu. This is the point. And like we said, it's not something which is going to be habitual in the life of a Muslim. In Insaf, in one of the books, the fund, in one of the books of the Hanbali Madhab, it says that this applies also to somebody who has desires that the husband and wife will have. Okay? That if you are in the situation as a man, you have to fulfill that desire, then go ahead and fulfill that desire first, make ghusl, and then go ahead and pray. For the same reason, for establishing khushu. The next thing which is disliked in the Salah, he says, وَتِكْرَارُ الْفَاتِحَةِ To repeat the Fatiha. Why? Because some of the ulama, they took this repeating of a rukan as being something haram, as being something which is not allowed, right? And you notice previous lessons we mentioned that the humbly scholars, when they find that there's kind of an agreement in the other madhahib that... Uh, something is haram, though they hold it not to be haram, they will put it as makru many a time. Not all the time, but many a time. Okay? So here is the situation. So tikrar al-fatiha, to repeat the fatiha in the salah for a person is something which is makru. Does anybody have an exception to this? If you weren't sure? Waswas, what did we say about this waswas? 
with regards to ibadah? Huh? Yes, very good. So doubt doesn't remove certainty, but something else pertaining to an act of worship. Once the act of worship is done, we said that you forget it. Once you've done the act of worship, so you recite Surah Al-Fatiha, forget it. You prayed it correctly. So once it's done, don't think about did I do it correctly or did I not do it correctly? Because this way shaitan will come to you and develop a habit of whispering to you about your acts of worship. So now here, what I'm looking for is, for example, that the person, he does this for khushur. The person is pondering upon the meanings of Surah Al-Fatiha. So they said in this situation, if the person recites the Fatiha again and again, then it's permitted. Though it's, uh, it's khilaf al-awla, though it's better not to do that, because the Prophet ﷺ never did it, right? So if the person wanted to do tadabbar of this surah, uh, and he repeated it in the salah, then it's an exception from it being makruh, though it's better not to do it. Tayyip, now the author, he moves on to talking about the things which are permitted for you to do in the Salah. He's finished mentioning those things which are makruh, disliked for you to do in the Salah. So he says, لَا جَمْعُ سُوَرٍ فِي فَرْضٍ كَنَفْلٍ It's allowed for you, meaning it's not makruh for you to combine a number of surah in one raka'ah, whether it be fard or nafl. Okay? So you can put together a number of surah you don't have to recite just one surah. You can put together a number of them and pray them in one raka'ah. Then he says, وَلَهُ رَدُّ الْمَارِ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ وَلَهُ And it's allowed for him, the terminology of the imam, it's allowed for him to prevent somebody from walking in front of him. The mashhur in the madhab is that it's not allowed for him, it's not mubah, rather it's mustahab, it's something which is recommended to do. So there's a the difference, right? But the author, he chose that terminology that it's allowed for him. Walahu. But the mashhur, the famous opinion in the madhab is that it's mustahab to do. Radul mar bayna yaday al-musalli. Okay? Because in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا صَلَّى أَحَدُكُمْ إِلَىٰ شَيْءٍ يَسْتَرُهُ مِنَ النَّاسِ فَأَرَادَ أَحَدًا فَأَرَادَ أَحَدٌ أَنْ يَجْتَاز بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ فَلْيَدْفَعْهُ فَإِنْ أَبَى فَلْيُقَاتِلْهُ فَإِنَّهُ شَيْطَان the Prophet ﷺ said that if one of you prays to a thing which separates him from the people, يَسْتُرُهُ عَنِ النَّاسِ And then a person wants to go between him and that thing, then he should stop him. And if the person refuses to be stopped, then he should fight him. Not literally box him, but he should push him. Okay? Because verily that person is a shaitan for doing that. So the hadith is telling us that if somebody has a sutra and he wants to stop a person from going in between him and that sutra then you have the right to stop that person in fact it says that if the person doesn't stop you go further and you can push them right from passing by you so the hadith mentioned that the person is a shaitan what does it mean by he's a shaitan he could be the best of people but maybe he forgot or maybe he didn't know the ruling of that thing so why would it be called that he's a shaitan this is one of the opinions that the ulama mentioned, that the shaitan is there with him, encouraging him to do the action and making him forget the right of the musalli. Okay? And the other thing is that this is the action of the shaitan. The shaitan himself tries to do this. So in any case, we know that we shouldn't go between a one who has a sutra and the one who is praying. Any prayer, any prayer, okay? And even if the person doesn't have the sutra, you should be three arms length away from him if you want to move in front of him. Barakallah, I was just about to come to that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, three things so far, right? Whether it's, na, whether it's fard or nafal, the ruling applies. If he doesn't have sutra, then three arms length you should try to avoid. If it's in a place which is busy, then the person is excused, like the haram, etc. Okay? If it's a place which is busy, then the person is excused. The next thing he mentions which is allowed, he says, وَعَدُّ ay." He's saying here that the person, if he wishes to do so, he can count the verses that he's reciting on his fingers or however he wants to count them a person for whatever reason some of the salaf is narrated that they did this they counted the verses that they were reciting in the salah who can think of another thing which may need to need to be counted in the salah or a situation where somebody needs to count in the salah huh? maybe 
if somebody has that issue where he's losing, maybe he needs to count the raka'at. The Salatul Eid, Takbiratul Ihram, how many Takbiratul Eid? Right? The seven and then the six, or the seven and the five according to your opinion. So the person here is allowed to do that. Walfatuh ala imamihi. Walfatuh ala imamihi. Which means that when the imam makes a mistake, then you are allowed to correct your imam. Right? It's, must, it's wajib in Surah Al-Fatiha and mustahab in other surahs. If the person makes a mistake, it's wajib in Fatiha and mustahab recommended in other surahs. Why is it wajib in Fatiha? Why is it obligatory in Fatiha? Because it's a pillar of the Salah. If the Salah of the Imam is incorrect in the Fatiha, then everybody else's Salah will be incorrect. Okay? So here it's a must that if somebody's behind him and knows how to correct him, then they should correct him. And the ulama, they give the adab, is that you shouldn't rush. You hear some people, as soon as the Imam, he makes quarter of a mistake. He hasn't made the full mistake yet. He's just started to make the mistake. They start to shout from wherever and try to correct the Imam. This is not adab. This is not the mannerisms pertaining to how you should be with the Imam. Rather, let the Imam make the mistake. Then let him try to correct himself again and again if he wishes to do so. When the Imam stops and he's become silent now, meaning that he's waiting for someone to help him, then the one who wants to make a correction upon the Imam should make the correction, right? Not like, and don't do it from, if you are far away and the Imam can't hear you, all you're doing is making noise in the masjid. So allow the people behind the Imam to correct him when the Imam needs that correction. Also the author, Rahimullah, Allah have mercy upon him, is saying, وَلُبْسُ thawb. It's permitted for a person if there is a need to do so, that he can wear extra clothing in the salah, right? or a piece of clothing in the salah. Maybe he started out his prayer with that which was only available to him, which is not correctly covering his aura. But then as he's praying, somebody came by him and put a piece of clothing next to him. So in that situation, if it doesn't take too much movement and there's a need, like there is in this situation that I'm describing, he can wear clothing, he can put something on. And this is found in Bukhari and Muslim, in the hadith of Wa'il ibn Hujr that the Prophet Sallallahu put on some clothing whilst he was praying. وَلَفُّ imama, And it's permitted for the person to wrap his turban, if his turban has come off, whilst he's praying. Again, based upon need and if it doesn't take too much movement, right? Also, if he's wearing a shamar, the ghutra, and it comes misplaced, then he's allowed to do so. But this shouldn't be something which is done for no need. And you know, he's just gone slightly off the crease and he wants to put it back to the middle. No. It's like if it's coming off his head, he can put it back on. But of course, we know that the best is to avoid all of this if possible and to stop any movement that is not needed in the salah. But if one does do it, don't be like I used to think, what's wrong with this crazy person moving his uh, turban around? It's permitted if there is a need to do so. The author is telling us. And it's permissible for you to kill a snake or to kill a scorpion in the salah. Al Khamsa, the five, who are the five? The famous five narrators of hadith, not the TV series. Huh? Did you say Sahih Muslim? Books of Sunan, Tirmidhi, Dawood, Nisa'i, Ibn Majah, Ahmad. Barakallahu feekum. So the Prophet Sallallahu said in the Salah, said in the hadith narrated by the Khamsa, Uqtulu al aswadaini fi salah. Kill the two black things in the salah. al hayya wal aqrab The snake and the scorpion, right? But you know us, if we see a scorpion, we're not going to kill it. We're going to run off, right? We're going to leave the salah and go on. Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, if you see a scorpion whilst praying, then it's permissible for you to take steps and go and get something and then kill it. And you're still in the salah. You haven't broken your salah. But obviously, according to the norms, it doesn't mean you go out to your neighbor's house, get something, come back. Then the author says what is also permissible, wa qumul, okay, lice and nits and something of that sort that you have in your head. Ida kana yashgil al musalli wa yu'dihi. If this thing is harming you and bothering you in the salah, then you can make the movement to kill what you have, which is bothering you, right? Which something biting you, a tiny insect or what lice. But some, be very careful, if there's a fly coming by, don't smack it so hard that you end up hitting the person next to you. Right? You see some people overreact with the flies and whatnot in the salah. So the qumul, he's saying, if you kill it and make that movement to do so, then it's permissible. 
فَإِنْ أَطَالَ الْفِعْلِ عُرْفًا مِنْ غَيِّ ضُرُورَةٍ وَلَا تَفْرِيقٍ بَطَلَتٍ He's saying now, if you do actions in the salah, which are needed, right? He said, if you do an action in the salah, and it's taking a long time, urfan, the long time is based upon the customary norms, okay? مِنْ غَيْرِ ضُرُورَةٍ And there's no need for you to do that action, and there's no tafriq, there's no separation of the action, then your salah will become invalid. So here he's putting some conditions for you. If you did the action, it will break your salah. The first of them, he said, itala. Itala means length. That if it's a long period of action, then your salah is going to be broken. So what is a long period of action? How do we determine if something is a long period of action in the salah? What did the author say? He said, urfan, customarily. So what if it's understood to be customarily long in the salah, in your community, then that is taken as being long. Also some of the Hanbali scholars, they gave a nice dhabit, they gave a nice controlling rule. They said that if somebody sees you from a distance and they determine you not to be in the salah, mean that they look at you and they don't imagine that you're in the salah due to the amount of movements that you're doing or due to the fact that you're moving for a long period of time, then this is what it means to have a long action. So the first thing, the author's opinion, which is that it's customarily, that which is customarily long, is long. The other is that if somebody was to see you and they were to, you know, uh, imagine you not to be in the salah due to your movements, then that is what a long movement is. And then also, وَإِنْ يَكُونُ لِغَيْرِ ضُرُورًا That this action that you are doing is for a non-necessity. If it's for necessity, then your salah is not invalid. But if it's for non-necessity, if there's no need for you to do it, uh, then it breaks. But if there was a need, the ruling wouldn't apply to you. ثالث وأن تكون الحركات متوالية and also he said the author he said ولا تفريق and there's no separation in the actions what this means is that before we apply the ruling of your salah is invalid we have to look at these actions that you are doing is is there a تفريق or there's not تفريق for example the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم at times would pick up his niece or nephews right in the salah in each salah it's narrated that he picked up his niece and then he would in each rak'ah and then he would put her down. So if you were to add the movements together, there are a lot of movements which would break the salah. But the fact that the Prophet ﷺ did them in each rak'ah means that there was tafriq. So if a person is doing these movements but is with tafriq, there's with separation, then it doesn't break the salah. However, if there was no tafriq, then the salah would be broken. So these are some of the important things needed to be mentioned pertaining to that point. Walaw sahwan. The Imam, he says, even if this above statement that he made about breaking the Salah due to these actions, it would break even if the person didn't realize that he was doing them, meaning that he was forgetful, sahwan, right? He did them forgetfully. Even in this situation, according to the author and the madhab, it would still break the Salah. However, Majd ibn Taymiyyah from the Hanbali scholars, he said, no, in the situation of forgetfulness, it doesn't break the Salah. Majd ibn Taymiyyah. The author says, وَيُبَاهُ قِرَاءَةُ أَوَاخِرِ الصُّورِ أَوْ وَأَوْسَاطُهَا وَأَوْسَاطُهَا It's permitted for you to read the surahs in the salah from the end of the surah or from the middle of the surah or from the beginning of the surah. So you can read the surah from wherever you want to do so. But you have to be very careful of one thing, which is what? When you're reading surahs and you want to start from the beginning or the middle or the end or you want to stop in a particular place. What do you think is very careful you have to do when you read the surah? The order of the surah? No, not the orders of the surahs. The meaning, like for example, the sentence where it ends. Exactly, the meaning is very important. You have to end it on a meaning which is correct. Okay? It doesn't change the meaning of the salah. فَوَيْلٌ lilmusallin, Woe to those who pray. And you stopped gives the complete wrong meaning, right? It's not the meaning that the surah intended whatsoever. طيب. وَإِذَا نَابَهُ شَيْءٌ سَبَّحَ رَجُلٌ If there's something in the salah, he needs to warn somebody of something, or he needs to reply to something in the salah, then he makes tasbih. وَصَفَّقَتْ إِمْرَأَةٌ بِبَطْنِ كَفِّهَا عَلَى ذَهْرِ الْأُخْرَى And the woman, she makes tasfiq. She does the slapping with the inside of the hand, to the outside whilst in the salah like so. Okay, because the Prophet ﷺ said in Bukhari and Muslim, مَن نَابَهُ شَيْءٌ فِي الصَّلَاةِ فَلْيُسَبِّحْ فَإِنَّمَا تَصْفِيقُ لِلنِّسَاءِ That whoever needs to make 
this uh, type of announcement in the salah, then let him make tasbih, say subhanallah loudly. And for, for verily, the clapping is for the woman. So the clapping like this in the salah is for the woman. So she, maybe she's praying and her child is about to do something which is dangerous. So she wants to warn the child in the salah, so she claps. And if the man was doing that and he wants, he's, he wants to do the same thing, he says loudly, subhanallah. Or maybe there's somebody knocking on his door frantically and he wants to let them know that I'm praying. So he raises his voice and says, subhanallah. And the woman, she does with her hands, slapping them. Uh, with regards to having to spit, he says, if you're in the prayer, you can do it on your left, not on your right. Make sure your wife is not standing on the left. You do it on your left, not on the right, if you have to. And in the masjid, if you need to spit, you do it in your clothing. But obviously, if you've got common sense, you know you're sick, you take tissues with you, and you just do it in the tissue. طيب? So you're not allowed to spit except for on your left. And in the masjid, if you're in the situation, you would put it in your clothing. And it's recommended for the person to take a sutra when he's praying. Abi Dawood collects an Imam Nawi in Khulasat al Ahkam. He said it's authentic that the Prophet said, Ida salla ahadukum fal yusalli ila sutratin wal yudnu minha. That the Prophet said, if one of you prays, then let him pray close to a sutra, let him take a sutra and come close to it. Let him take a sutra and come close to it. Qa'imatin kamu'akharati rahal. What is a sutra? The author is telling us something which is of height like the, end, like the back of a saddle. So the saddle, the old saddles that they used to use, they used to have like two sticks, one on the front and one on the back. So he's referring to the sutra is like the height of the back of the saddle. And this is like three arms length. Sorry, dhira, nisful dhira wa akthar. Like half an arm's length or more. The height of something which is ha half an arm's length or more. Okay? And the person should come close as possible to the sutra. What are the wisdoms of taking a sutra in the salah? Apart from it being recommended sunnah. People know that you are praying, so they won't bother you. They won't come up and start a conversation with you. It prevents you from looking at everything around you because you're concentrating in the space between you and the sutra. Okay? And also, it prevents people from passing in between you. The author, he says, may Allah have mercy upon him. If he doesn't find a shakhis, that thing which is raised off the ground, like we said, an arm's length or more, uh, then he should make a line in the ground. Then he should make a line in the ground. Abi Dawood and Ahmed narrated a hadith from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said, إِذَا صَلَّ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيَجْعَلْ تِلْقَاءَ وَجْهِهِ شَيْئًا If one of you is praying, then let him put something in front of him, meaning a sutra. فَإِنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَلْيَنْصِبْ عَصًا And if he cannot find something to put in front of him as a sutra, then let him put a stick or a spear in front of him. فَإِنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ مَعْهُ عَصًا فَلْيَخْطُطْ خَطًا If he doesn't have that either, meaning the spear or the stick, let him put a line on the ground as his sutra. ثُمَّ لَا يَضُرُّهُ مَا مَرَّ أَمَامَهُ And then nothing will harm him which moves in front of him, meaning nothing will harm his prayer. So according to this opinion, a line can suffice as a sutra if you have nothing else to put in front of you as a sutra. However, many of the scholars, they debate this hadith in its authenticity and it needs a lot more research and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but the author holds this opinion. And if a black dog was to come in front of him in the salah, this would break his salah. And then he said faqat. He said only. Only the black dog. Does anybody know why he said only? Only the black dog. Ahsant. Because the other opinions, they say the passing of the woman also breaks the salah and the passing of the mule, the donkey, also breaks the salah, right? But the author is saying only the black dog. The, the, the dog which is fully black doesn't have other colors with it. That's what he means by the word bahim. Uh, in Sahih Muslim, Al-Kalb Al-Aswad, Shaytan, that the black dog is one of the devils, right? So the author's opinion and the official opinion of the madhab is that the, the donkey and the woman do not break the salah, right? Only the black dog does. However, Ibn Qudama Al-Maqdisi and Ibn Taymiyyah from the Imams of the Madhab, they hold that it does. 
If the woman passes by or the black dog passes by, then it breaks your salah. But the official opinion, like our author mentioned, is that it's only the black dog. The last one or two sentences, he says, And it's permissible for him to seek refuge when he comes to a verse which talks about the threat of Allah as well as punishment. And it's permissible for him to ask Allah's mercy when he comes to a verse which talks about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if that be in the fard salah, meaning that it's the same for the nafl salah or the fard salah. Because ma thabata fil nafl thabata fil ard illa bid dalil. That which is established in the nafl as a rule is established in the fard except with an evidence which would separate the two. So the Prophet sallallahu in Sahih Muslim is narrated that he read Surah Al-Baqarah. He read Surah An-Nisa and Surah Al Imran. Somebody asked about the, somebody mentioned about the tartib of the surah in the previous question that I asked, right? And this is one of the hadiths where the Prophet ﷺ read the surahs, not in order. So he read Baqarah, then he read An-Nisa and Al Imran. And it was mentioned that each time he would come across a verse which would mention the punishment of Allah, جل, he would seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And each time it came to the verse, we would speak about the mercy or the Jannah, then, Allah, then the Prophet Sallallahu would seek Allah's mercy and would seek his Jannah. So first of all, in one raka, he reads Baqarah, he reads An-Nisa and Ali Imran, right? Five hours worth of recita- re- recitation. And on top of that, he's stopping and pausing and seeking dua from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in one raka. So this is allowed for a person to do, even if he's an Imam, but if it's gonna cause difficulty to the uh, people who are praying, then he shouldn't do that. One time we were praying in Salat Tarawih behind the Imam, uh, Sheikh Sufi, uh, you know, a great alim, if you know him, in Qira'ah, in Quran, here in Doha. And he prayed all of Baqarah in one raka'ah. And afterwards he apologized. He said, I completely forgot. He said, I was lost in the surah. Because that's how these people are, right? They're so attached to what they're reciting, they forget what they're doing. So to him, uh, the whole of Surah Baqarah in one was nothing whereas us we were like all over the place but in any case afterwards he apologized so the author is saying that it's permissible for t- you to do that to uh, yani pray seeking refuge in Allah Azawajal and making dua to Allah Azawajal for his rahmah uh, but try to ensure that it doesn't harm those who are praying behind you if they are praying behind you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best we'll stop here inshallah anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the shortcomings and mistakes were from myself and shaitan. I ask Allah Azawajal to make this small deed heavy in our scale of good deeds and to give us the ajr of making the effort to come here, inshaAllah. Wa jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa If you have any questions.